Sushan. I wrote an offer for a house, but it was rejected. Wait, there's a couple of things. One, how come I didn't know about this? <laughs> and two, what did you do wrong that we got it rejected? I don't know. It was probably one of these 10 things that you can do, 10 reasons why your offer to buy a house was rejected. So stay tuned. What's up, everybody? I'm Sean Dezod. And I'm Courtney Dezod, and we're with Keller Williams Realty right here in St. George, Utah. And if you want to know everything about living in St. George, don't forget to press on the subscribe button, and don't forget to press on the little bell so you're notified every time that we upload a new video, because we upload new videos every week. Yes, and honestly, we love making these videos. How much do we love making these videos? They're, they're fun. Yeah, they are. But you know what we love more? We actually love to help you with your real estate needs. So whether you're looking to buy or sell a home, what you want to do is you want to give us a call, shoot us a text, or send us an email. Or you can reach out to us via WhatsApp. However you want to get a hold of us, we've got your back. Because remember, we're licensed realtors. So that's what we do for a living. So these aren't in any particular order, but I'm just, you know, leaving them one through 10. So number one. Price. <laughs> okay, well, that isn't number one, but let's talk well, about that. I would say that's an order, okay. price. Okay, in order, price. Okay, talk about it. Talk about the price. Like, so I, I have this house. It's a beautiful house. Price said, that's cool million. Yeah, price said, ooh, I love, you know, that's a beautiful little house range right now. But, you know, I want to go off of 2020 prices, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an offer for, for $500,000. Okay, so explain. Some people, they kind of want to do, like, they see a house that just comes on the market, and then they want to do a little ball offer. So what is what is that going to do for you? Yeah, so, two, so there's two things wrong with this, right? So one is that when you're making a low ball offer, First, you have to understand the market that you're in. When it's a when it's a pretty hot seller's market, low ball offers just aren't going to happen anyway. So that's 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 strike number one. But second thing, and, and it is that you want to be mindful of the time on market because the thing is, if a property just just hits the market, even if that's if that seller is unrealistic, right? Some obviously we I've, I've certainly encountered that are, sellers that are shooting for the moon, and reality has to you know really reality has to hit, and I could let them know, hey, your property as much as you thought it was worth a million dollars. It really isn't worth that much, but they're not going to get that like f like day one. Yeah, so, they, they need to hear the crickets. Yeah, they, yeah, they need to hear <laughs> like they need to get like let other people be the guinea pig and submit those low ball offers for like, to kind of prime the sell a little bit if that's going to be the case. But yeah, you're going to have that you're going to need that that property to sit on the market for a few weeks, months maybe, like for them to kind of come down because every seller is a little bit different. Some some are more aggressive to act. Some will well, some will start making price reductions within a week or two. Other ones. They're going to hold on and they'll go months and months without making any price reductions. So it's one of those things where you really have to take into account, well, one, a, like a crazy low ball offer, you're not going to find much of a reception for it anyway. But second, you've got to give that property kind of time to marinate. You need that seller to marinate in the fact that they get that what they thought the property is worth is not really what it is. So another reason your offer will get rejected is that you didn't get pre-approved for a loan. So explain. Yeah. So this is if you're like getting financing, if you're paying cash. You don't have to worry about this. That that really helps. But if you're getting financing, the seller doesn't know who you know. They, they get your offer, and I go, like, "Great, here's an here's an offer on the place. What like can Courtney actually fulfill on like fulfill her end of the bargain and get the financing to close the deal?" I don't. You know, the seller doesn't know Courtney, so they go, "Okay, like I don't know nothing about this person." And so it doesn't show. It's two things. One, it doesn't show that you're necessarily able to, but it also shows just a lack of polish with the offer. You want to look, you want to put your best foot forward. A good first impression is super important. That's why you want to have your ducks in a row. You want to pro provide proof of funds showing that you have the money in the bank to do the down payment. But second, you want to have the pre-approval that's showing that, okay, this lender has already looked through your finances and felt like you do qualify for that million dollar purchase. So Sean mentioned this. So uh, another reason you get it rejected is that you don't have your proof of funds ready to go. So explain that. Yeah, so people will kind of go, okay, Okay, so you, you qualify for a 50% down loan. Where's that other $500,000? Like, I don't see any, I don't see any sort of statement it's or anything. There. Yeah, it's it. Just trust us. Yeah, trust us. We have IOUs. What is this? What is this? Where's all the money? That's as good as money, sir. Those are IOUs. <laughs> <laughs> for $250,000. I thought it was two hundred seventy-five thousand. Oh, that might be. Yeah, yeah that's we're, right. we're, we're you're getting a dumb and dumber. Dumb and dumber yes. Yeah. So, so basically, so the thing is that you want to show a statement. Now, you don't have to show. You know, I know people kind of get a little bit weird out as to having to show a statement. What you do is you redact. So you like you white out or you clear out the um, account numbers. But you do show. Okay, 
Courtney, does Odd this much money in the bank, basically? That's that's the main thing. They want to just see that you have the funds to be able to do the, your, your part of the deal, which is the down payment. And then, of course, you still follow up with a, with a pre-approval letter showing that the bank's ready to give the money for the rest of the, uh, the rest of the deal. So another reason you'll get rejected is you didn't move fast enough. So explain that. Yeah, I mean, you know, in a market that's, you know, like like a seller's market, things can move pretty fast. And so, you you know, you just can't take your time like, oh, I saw this property a month ago. I, I want to write an offer. Right? Yeah. Well, I went to escrow three weeks ago. So that's kind of, you know, things can move pretty fast. And especially if the property is like priced right, it's a nice house, you know, a nice house or whatever, it can move very fast. It can be sold in a few days. So that that's where you want to make sure that, you know, you kind of pounce on these opportunities. And that's what we, you know, we want to reach out to us because even though let's say you're not in the area, but this property really caught your eye or caught our eye and we recommended it to you to check, to check out and you want to make that move. Well, one, even if you're not here physically, we can do a virtual tour, check out the property, check out the neighborhood for you, like, you know, give you a video of that or do a FaceTime so that way you kind of get a sense of it. And obviously we can go through, you know, do our due diligence as far as figuring out like how this property like looks as far as financing and all that stuff. But you want to move quick because, you know, again, I hate for you to like fall in love with the property. It's a right home, but you weren't ready to act quickly enough and it's gone. And, and actually, we'd say. And in fact, there's a property that we were really interested in when we were first moving here and it was already gone. And oh, we were yeah. like, yeah, Sean, Sean's soul is still, my, it still yeah, hurts. It still hurts. <laughs> So another reason your offer is rejected is that within your offer, you are asking for a long escrow. So yeah, and this is actually, this is not every seller will, will reject it based off this, but enough will that, that it could actually cause a lot of friction. So I had, I had a client, they needed to do a 45 day escrow, which doesn't sound like it's ridiculous, but when, you know, these days people are doing like 21 day escrows, 30 day escrows, some are even doing 14 day escrows. So, so they're doing very condensed escrows and all of a sudden they see a 45 and going, Wait, why is it a 45 day escrow? Why is that so long? Or like a 60 day escrow? Like it just, mm -hmm. it just puts me, like there's a lot of question marks, and especially if a seller has multiple offers to choose from, they're just gonna go with the one that kind of sounds clean. Like they're just gonna go, okay, the, what sounds normal or like, or shorter? Like, because, you know, these sellers are on time frame, timelines themselves. And so like, let's say they're looking to sell their home to buy something else. They need that, uh, they need that deal to feel, they need to feel really solid about their current sale so they can make their purchase. And that's why you want to reach out to us because we obviously have preferred lenders. So we can give you several lenders that we work with that we know they can take care of you. And that way they can, you know, get you like these timelines that will work, you know, make it tight. So it makes your offer sound really, really good. And in fact, the lenders that we work with, what they do to help make this, you know, make your offer sound really good is that they'll actually reach out to the listing agent and like personally advocate on your behalf, telling them, you know, how solid the buyer is and, you know, basically fully like explain to the real, the, the agent, okay, this is our qualifications the, you know, they're solid. We can close this fast so they can make, you know, they can kind of butter up that listing agent to feel really good about, you know, a bit about you as a buyer. So another reason your offer is rejected is the terms of your offer were, you know, unsavory. Un unsavory. They just weren't as good as maybe the other offer. So what do you mean by terms? What is the term of the offer? Yeah. So everyone knows like price is something, right? But then other terms that are important are contingency periods, right? And so what a contingency is, is that's the time frame that you have to uh, so fulfill a certain action. Like let's say, okay, your appraisal contingency is 17 days. And someone goes, oh, I don't want my appraisal contingency to be 25 days. And you're going to consult going, okay, this, this deal is kind of not a real deal until these contingencies are over. So the shorter you can make these contingencies, the better. But if you have these elongated contingency periods, it just makes the seller not feel super comfortable, especially if, they have, if, if there's competing offers that have short, you know, nice, tight, short contingency periods that seller is going to feel like much more solid about them. And so that's why they would like kind of look away from yours. And on top of that, let's say other terms are like, let's say the buyer is asking the seller to pay for their, you know, their closing costs. Well, that's another point. Another reason you'll get rejected is you ask the seller to pay for your closing costs. Oh yeah, that's nice. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, this other part, this other point, so which is kind of related to the terms is basically this, you're at, you know, you as a buyer asking the seller to pay for like $10,000 of the buyer's closing costs. It doesn't make you sound very solid as a buyer because sell sellers want to kind of go with again a slam dunk, right? They want it the, like they've already let's say if they in their mind they committed to you as a buyer. Now the next thing is they want to make sure that with multiplying the offers, they go, you know what? I just want the deal that's going to close. Like I, I don't want the, this to fall out of escrow and be a situation where I have to put it back on the market. I don't know if I'm going to get this price that I was going to getting we going initially was on the market in the first place. So it's all these like question marks, and the more question marks you give them the more they're going to sour on you. Like, and then, because especially if you're coming with other offers, they just want to go, they just, I mean, and let's say they're similar price and everything. 
You want to, I just want the, I want this deal to be a slam dunk. I want this thing done. And then when it comes to like, you know, so like the, the buyer's closing costs, well, one, it kind of spe- speaks of the financial stability of the buyer. So it maybe shows that the buyer doesn't really have, you know, that much money because they're asking the seller to pay for the closing costs. And then on top, and, and again, you're competing with other offers that are like, say, a cash offer or like 20% down or whatever. That just sounds to sell, to sell like a more solid deal. But on top of that, when you're, put, like when you're asking the buyer, you know, when the buyer's asking the seller to pay, let's say, for $10,000 of the closing costs, Really, what they were saying is that they're financing that amount into the purchase price of the property, right? So that makes even so that triggers an issue with potential appraisal issues because now you artificially propped up the price ten thousand dollars to account for those closing costs that the seller is paying for. Because at the end of the day, the seller doesn't care about what the sale price is; they care about what's their net. Like, what do they make out at the end of the day? The cash in their pocket, right? That's what matters. So you could, you know, if you if you offer a property for five hundred, you know, for a million dollars, and you have to sell it, pay for like make concessions at a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, that's not a million dollar offer. That's a nine hundred thousand dollar offer, right? So that's kind of how the seller has, looks at these things. And so when you're making these, you know, artificial property up the, the values, now the appraiser not only has to make, you know, m- like come up with the price that the property, you know, like they have to come up with the sale price for us to not have any friction regarding the appraisal issue. And now you're kind of dealing with that whole just craziness. Yeah. And since Sean is mentioning an appraisal, one reason why you might lose out, and this is in like a super hot market, is that a competing offer might not have an appraisal contingency. So explain why some people decide to do this. Yeah. So one, okay, if you're paying cash, you don't need one, right? That's that's one thing that like, sellers love is that's so what, one less. So I guess explain what is an appraisal contingency for people that don't know? Sure. So an appraisal. So basically, let's say you buy, want to buy a house for a million dollars. That's great that you want to buy a house for a million dollars, but let's say you're getting financing. Well, the lender doesn't take doesn't go off of just the offer and going, okay, well, we'll finance that. They send out a professional, like an appraiser, to assess the value of that property. They're going, okay, is this property actually worth the million dollars that it's in escrow for? Because the lender is not going, they're going to go off of that appraised value as far as how they're doing their loan. So if it does, if it if it's if it's worth the appraiser deems that it's worth it, awesome, we're good. But then if the appraiser says, you know what, it's actually not worth a million dollars where it's worth nine hundred thousand dollars, now we've got a gap here, right? So you have the sale price of a million, the appraisal is nine hundred thousand dollars. So the lender only looks, they don't care about the million dollars anymore. They care about that nine hundred thousand. That's how they're valuing the property and how they're doing their loan calculations. So you have this gap. Now some some buyers, let's say if they're paying cash, there's no appraisal issue. If you're getting financing, obviously that a thousand a hundred thousand dollars is gonna be an issue. Someone's gonna to have to make up that gap. Where's the money, Lebowski? So whether that is the seller dropping their price from a million dollars to nine hundred thousand, or the buyer moving up, like so they're having to put an extra hundred thousand dollars out of their pocket to make the deal happen, or they're splitting the difference. Maybe they're going like nine fifty, like you know, to meeting halfway. But sellers, with they have multiple offers, some buyers go, you know what? I'm not gonna. I'm gonna like. I'm waiving the appraisal. I will step up to the plate. I don't care what it's gonna appraise for. I will pay. I'll, I'll pay that difference. The seller is going to really, obviously, if I have a listing and I see that, that's definitely going to resonate with me. And I'm going to like forward that to the seller too. I'm going to say, hey, this is way solid because that's one less it, one less way the buyer has an out. So it makes the deal that much more bulletproof. And then, but the, or maybe the buyer goes, okay, we don't want a 25 day appraisal. We'll do a 14 day. At least you're going, okay, as a seller, you're going, okay, this deal is kind of there's question marks to this deal up until 14 days, but at least after the 14th day. They feel really solid about the transaction. So there's all these little things that are kind of in play where it's not made, you know, you're if you're adding if you have a lot of question marks, it's just gonna make the seller just not feel confident about your offer and they'll just go with someone else. So another reason why your offer might be rejected is that you're being like a big stickler on possession and delivery. So so explain what does that mean? Yeah, so okay, when when escrow closes, when a deal officially closes, you know, how these offers are built in is that, you know, theoretically you get the key on that day that, you know, like as soon as you get confirmation of recording, so it's officially yours, deal is closed, you get the key that that same day. And then so, and it's for you, the property in theory is vacant and you can just move right in, right? That's that's the idea. Now, in practical terms, that's not gonna happen, like again, that, that doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes buyers like, you know, give the sellers a few extra days, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a month, you know, to move out of that property. And so that way, it gives that seller extra time to to get out. So at least they have their money, and then they can make their you know make their plans, or they can at least move like they can really in earnest start their move after the deal has actually closed. 
And if you have competing offers, maybe some of these buyers will offer those kind of concessions just to sweeten it just a little bit. So the seller goes, you know what? Okay, this is one less he- like headache that the word we have to worry about at the end of the deal. It's a nice gesture from the buyer's part. And so the seller may just go with that one rather than, you know, if everything else, like everything else being equal, they'll go with, they'll go, they may go with that offer. Now, some sellers do it. They actually do, like they want to move out by the end of the close of escrow. So it's, yeah. it's a moot point, but some of these sellers, it really does help. Yeah, and it's not like you're letting them live there for free. You, not you, necessarily. You, yeah, well, I guess you can negotiate. Right? Yeah, so you can do a, what, they call, what they call rent back. So the seller agrees to pay you, you know, a, a certain amount of rent for like, let's say that month that they're staying there. Or you could just say, you know what, you can stay here rent free for that month. It just makes it, it just swings off for that a little bit. So again, in every situation is unique. Every seller has different needs. Every property has different sets of offers on them. So that's where, you know, you would talk to us and we would be re-talking the listing agent to see what's going on, what's important to that seller to really kind of convey that to you so we can structure your offer properly. Another reason that your offer, and this is the last one, number 10, could get rejected is that the agent that you're working with is kind of a jerk to the <laughs> listing agent. And we've actually been on the other end of this. So explain. Oh yeah, we've been on both sides, right? So like I had a client that she was looking to buy an offer and she was competing against a cash offer. Now, so you have to understand these are these are humans that are involved here, right? And that seller of that property did not like the agent on the competing offer, so that so basically, yeah, he was kind of a jerk. Yeah, mm-hmm. so she, like that's so I was like, I I don't want to work with them if I don't have to. So she was giving, even though our client had a loan, and and the prices were the same, she went with our client because she just did not like that other the list you know, that other buyer's agent. So we're like it worked out in our favor. And then being in the listing agent on the other side, I definitely had some buyer's agents be very abrasive. So there's like, you know, some buyers are really good at, you know, buyer's agents are really good people, people, you know, like good, uh, per, like very personable. And so they'll just kind of, again, you just feel like a good vibe. They're making you feel very confident about their buyer, really kind of conveying that buyer's interest in how the deal is going to work. And, you know, they're super excited. And they have other agents that just kind of rub you the wrong way. And like, again, they're, you know, all those that are combative and you're going, wait, you know, we're all on the same page. We want the deal to happen. So like, why start off on that? You know, uh, uh, like why start off that way? You know, why, why are we taking two steps back right off, right, right from the beginning? So just, you know, again, as much as possible, people are trying to be objective, but again, let's be real. We are humans. We do have emotions and that does come, on, come into play. So that's it. That's our video. And remember, we are licensed realtors right here in the state of Utah. So as much as we love like doing these videos, what we love more is to help you with your real estate needs. So whether you're looking to buy or sell a home, what you want to do is you want to give us a call, shoot us a text, or send us an email. Or you can reach out to us via WhatsApp. However you want to get a hold of us, we've got your back. Bye.